Joining me today in the Capital TV show, uh, Ruth Wasserman Lenzi. She's Israel Knesset member. Uh, you are most welcome. Thank you so much, Maria. It's my honor. You're joining me from Tel Aviv. Uh, recently, I published a video, but it seems that the member of Knesset that he spoke on this video, it was in uh, Netanyahu government. But the question can be raised right now is how much the the Knesset can be threatened by any influence by the Muslim Brotherhood. I know that it is the first time that the Arabs coalition are represented in the Knesset. So is there any fear of uh, had any um, um, interaction with a terrorist organization or can be influencer, influencer inside the Knesset? <laughs> أي حركة إسلامية بكل أنحاء العالم التي تصوت ضد اللغة العربية ضد لغة الكون الكريم أنتم حركة إسلامية لا مخيب كباي خبر كريسيت أنتم الكنيسات تاع so thank you for the question. In fact, for the very first time, there is a coalition in Israel in which an Arab party, uh, any Arab party, is a part of the coalition. So it was a quite an unusual um, out of the box kind of thing. And the coalition is so heterogeneous, so different. It has parties from the right wing, from the center, from the left, and even the uh, Islamic uh, movement. To answer your question, there's no uh, Muslim Brotherhood at all uh, in the uh, Israeli Knesset, the parliament. This is something that is completely uh, not uh, there. Uh, there is the joint Arab list, mm -hmm. which is in the opposition, and it includes several parties. Actually, the Islamic party used to be part of it, but it broke away and joined the coalition. The other Arab parties are against the coalition, together with the Netanyahu government, mm -hmm. uh, the former Netanyahu government members of Knesset. So it's a bit strange, but they are together in the opposition currently. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, recently, you tweeted saying civil war can develop uh, from those events that happened from the city of Lod. The level of tension there is insane. It will spill over to the world, to the whole country. What, can you describe more the situation there? Of course, of course. The city of Lod is one of about seven mixed uh, Jewish and Arab cities. Uh, in the last May, uh, we had uh, the war with Gaza, Hamas uh, elements sending rockets onto Israeli civilian population, by the way, both Arab and Jewish, and the Israeli IDF responding. And because of tensions in the um, uh, inside that uh, mm. the Hamas, I would say, even manipulated regarding the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and uh, issues pertaining to the deep feelings of Muslims. Um, it was uh, kind of uh, brought these emotions into uh, the hands of several Arab factors on the Israeli street for the first time. And in that mixed city of uh, Lod, uh, there were quite a lot of acts of vandalism and uh, crime and violence. Mm -hmm. uh, which were very unfortunate and very painful to watch uh, because usually, even actually from 1948, nothing like this ever happened before. So this was the beginning and then it spread to other cities in Israel. Mm -hmm. But of course it stopped. Al-Aqsa was open uh, to all Muslims who want to pray. I think several days later already, there were hundreds of thousands of Muslims praying at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very unfortunate that uh, Hamas was making a manipulation of this, 
it can really tear up the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side, let's talk about the Abraham Accords. You are a co-chair uh, of the lobby for the promotion of Abraham Accords agreements or in the Knesset. Uh, I was uh, witnessing, uh, we, uh, we, as we were uh, seeing a delegation, Bahraini delegation, uh, they came to Tel Aviv. So uh, you said about the Bahrain initiative that it will be an open other wonderful connections. How do you evaluate this uh, these accords and what is the future of it so first of all i think that the abraham accords are game changing they are a wonderful opportunity for israel to really become a role player in the middle east in the gulf area and in general and when i say role player i don't mean hegemon or god forbid in a negative manner on the contrary to become a partner in medical cooperation in technology in innovation, in things that can bring good to mankind. And I see this as something which is very, very incredible. That is why I'm chairing together with a member of the opposition. So in other words, I'm from the coalition, he's from the opposition. And together uh, in a bipartisan manner, we had uh, the pro Abraham Accords caucus in the Israeli Knesset. Mm -hmm. And this delegation that you're talking about, the Bahraini one, in fact, I'm uh, due to meet them tomorrow evening in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And yes, I do think that this is a potential and a possibility to not only strengthen those agreements that have already been signed, but to broaden the accords to more countries that are interested in this kind of partnership. Uh, any thoughts about the importance of the peace meeting that was held in Erbil recently? Actually, I wrote about this too. I think that the people that came out, uh, the Sunni uh, thinkers and the Shiite thinkers that came out and spoke about the opportunity that is encompassed in open relations with Israel, of course, they were very, very brave, very courageous. And um, I pray and hope that uh, they shall be safe and that their loved one will be saved. And I believe uh, strongly, and these are not just words for me, this, this is the way that I lead uh, my life, my professional life, my personal life for years, mm -hmm. um, that the good people of the region should come together. There are enough bad people, but the bad should not be uh, titled by the religion or the country, uh, but rather in terms of your heart. If you are open to cooperation, you would like to do good things for mankind, then there should be no boundaries. Of course, I understand that um, this is a very uh, kind of an optimistic mm -hmm. view. Uh, very difficult given the circumstances in the region. But I did work as advisor for late President Shimon Peres, mm -hmm. and he always quoted the uh, founder of our country, Ben Gurion, who said that he who does not believe in miracles is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, my mantra. Mm -hmm. uh, five years, you said, since the passing of former President Shimon Peres, with whom you had the privilege to work as his advisor. He was an uh, epitome of Ben-Gurion's perception that uh, he who does not believe in miracles and unrealistic uh, may rest in peace. Uh, what wa was the most important lesson you, you had uh, or you get from, uh, from uh, Shimon Peres? So I think that at the age of 90 plus, he was constantly and incessantly curious. Mm. And he said to me, always continue to be curious. He was never tired of learning more. It was unbelievable. Mm. He went to sleep at 11 o'clock, uh, woke up at 4, 5 a.m. and constantly wanted to change the world, even when he was over 90 years old, which was really an amazing lesson for me. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, you said the message presented by the Prime Minister Naftali Bennett at the UN was of good and important content. Can you explain more? Yes, I think that um, Naftali Bennett was basically saying, you know, Israel is here 
to cooperate with the family of nations. In other words, he spoke a lot about the corona mm-hmm. and about the corona, uh, the need of mankind, because the corona, of course, knows no boundaries. It doesn't care what is your race, what is your gender, what country you're from, your ethnic origin. It obviously spread around the world and millions of people were killed. And he spent quite a few minutes of his speech speaking about that and the way that Israel is trying and attempting to uh, deal with this pandemic. And I think that that was trying to reach out to um, the world in saying, you know, we are a nation like all nations. We shouldn't be singled out in a manner which is different to other nations that are uh, ostracized by several uh, countries. Uh, for example, Iran, and so on. And I think that there's more of the common denominator rather than the differences, the divisiveness. Uh, and that was the underlying message in his speech. Mm-hmm. On the other side, how you describe the current relationship between U.S. and Israel? Is it at the edge? I don't think so. I think that the Israeli-U.S. Uh, relationship is very strong. I think that the former government led by Netanyahu did uh, put an emphasis, uh, which was, um, in my humble opinion, not the right thing to do, uh, to make it more partisan. But the Israeli-U.S. relations are far beyond that and much more important than relating to one party or the other, either Democratic or Republican. And I think there is an important bridge to gap uh, after this government. And I believe and I can see behind the scenes also um, my government at the moment and the coalition bridging that gap. There's Mm -hmm. very hard work being done vis-a-vis the current administration, um, but there is no specific um, affiliation that Israel needs to make towards one side or the other. And that's very important to state. Uh, is, is this Israeli government is willing to, to put more effort in the two-state solution or is there any other point of view? So at the moment, I must be honest with you, this is a topic which is obviously contentious. It's not an easy topic to deal with for a very wide range of uh, reasons, but I want to touch upon two. One, there's no real roadmap um, that is laid on the table, neither from the Palestinian side nor from the Israeli side or from a third uh, party, Mm -hmm. not an operative uh, solution. Now, in my humble opinion, again, and the opinion of my party, the blue and white one, led by Benny Gantz, the current Minister of Defense, um, if there's a way there needs to be a two-state solution. This is a good uh, solution. Mm -hmm. However, this is a very, very, um, I would say, pluralistic, and we've spoken about it a couple of minutes ago, coalition. In other words, it has the conservative Islamic party on the left, plus left-wing parties like Labour and Meretz, up until, you know, uh, Tikva Hadasha, and uh, Yamina, both very right-wing parties, and my party being in the middle, and Yeshatid being in the middle, the center. So very, very pluralistic, very difficult to decide on one specific policy um, on issues that are very contentious. And we had a goal, this coalition. First of all, to change the government that was in place for 12 long years, Um, with whose policies we did not agree, and that was the Netanyahu-led government, Mm -hmm. and to deal with the corona crisis and to pass a budget, a national budget after three whole years in which a budget was not passed. We had four elections, was a very unsettling time for the citizens of Israel, and it was very important for us to do those two things for the benefit of the inhabitants and the citizens. And that is the focus of this government at the moment. Will it then 
Mm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I think that the focus is to deal with internal problems and at the moment, priority. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one more question: Do you think that is there any way that uh, can be a strong uh, cooperation between? Uh, the, the countries that signed the Abraham Accords, example, UAE, uh, Bahrain, and Israel to confront the Iranian threats, and we hope uh, Saudi Arabia will join. What is your point of view on this matter? The answer is very definitely yes. I think that we have a like-minded coalition in terms of thinking. Uh, there isn't any plan to... Uh, do anything about it right now, but everybody knows that um, with the Iranian quest to gain uh, nuclear weapons and with their uh, really threats, very concrete threats against a lot of countries in the region, Israel is one of them, the, the, I would say the central one, but not the only one. Saudi Arabia, of course, is uh, um, also being threatened in very many ways via proxies and directly by the Iranian regime. And certainly um, there is a like-minded coalition uh, of countries uh, in this regard within the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. Do you support uh, the, uh, the position of Saudi Arabia, the complaint that they present to the UN uh, a few days ago uh, concerning the uh, Houthis attacks on Saudi soil? Of course. Of course, without a doubt, and uh, this is not an official uh, Israeli stance, but uh, because we have no official relations, but of course we support the uh, Saudi stance, there's no question. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question. Do you know who's, who, who is coming next, next in the Abraham Accords? Which country? <laughs> this is very curious from my side. So if you can help us to know more. I... I wish I could tell you, but I can tell you the following. Mm -hmm. I had very high level meetings with the senior White House people from the current Biden administration. When I was recently in Washington, I was very lucky and very privileged to have those talks. And um, they really confirmed to me that uh, as opposed to what their media says, that only the Trump supporters are in favor of the Abraham Accords, whereas the Biden ones are not, that that is not true, that they do support the Abraham Accords, that they are working on making the ties between Israel and Sudan mm -hmm. stronger, and that they are working on broadening the uh, accords to more countries. And that's all I can say. <laughs> so. do you, Rose, do you want to say something for the people in Lebanon about their situation, about yes. the, uh, the explosion, uh, Beirut, yes. yeah, any, any word you want to say, go on. I want to say very much. I want to say from the bottom of my heart, uh, and I know that I represent the opinion of a lot of Israelis, a lot. We don't have diplomatic relations and this is not a country that we have uh, a peace with. But the people of Israel hurt and are feeling the pain of the people of Lebanon. And this is not just a statement to sound pretty to anybody. This is true. The Tel Aviv municipality put up the flag of Lebanon when this happened. Uh, I know that a lot of uh, bloggers and people commented in Lebanon cynically about it, but uh, there was no cynicism in this act. And uh, there were a lot of discussions in the studios, in the TV studios uh, during that time, speaking about what a tragedy in general, the Lebanese, the pluralistic Lebanese population is undergoing. So all I can say, and I hope that it will be received in the clearest, most purest way, uh, and I can say I'll be Abiyad, uh, that our hearts are with the Lebanese people. Thank you for your feelings uh, with this uh, statement. I end my interview with you, Ross Wasserman Landi. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Malouf, and thank you for all that you are doing for the good of uh, letting people know the various angles that are usually not seen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank <laughs> you.